right, let's do this. So hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Natalie. I am the head of communications here at QFVG. And I just want to say thank you, everyone, for joining us today for what we know will be a very informative webinar. Um, just before we kick off, I just wanted to let everyone know that um, at QFVG, yes, we are very growth centric, but we would be a very different organization without the support of our partners. And we're pleased to announce that uh, Focus HR have recently come on as a partner who cares. Uh, so partners who care are strategic business partners that work with us to support our members. Uh, and in the case of Focus HR, uh, that is the delivery of our workplace relations advice. So that's the two hours per year that members can access. Uh, that's maintaining our workplace relations shop and the products. And a little extra bonus for members is you can now access a 5% discount on other services offered by Focus HR. So while we are just waiting for the last few people, I might just hand over now to Naomi because I know there is a lot to get through today. There really yeah. is that. Thank you very much for that. Yeah, it's um, all good. And yeah, thanks everyone for joining. Good to see some uh, some known names in our list of, of members. We Apparently we've had about 80 people register for this. Um, and I know not everyone actually attends when they register it so that they get the, the recording afterwards. Um, so this session is getting recorded. It will be uh, shared um, afterwards. The other point is, like Natalie said, there is a ton of content to get through. So I am going to be speed talking and powering through the content. Uh, it is not my preferred way to deliver. I actually much prefer when it's quite interactive, but just to make sure that we get through the content. What I'm going to do is work my way through it. Um, our biggest priority is getting through the legislation changes. And then if we've got some time to sort of talk stats and interesting cases, we will. If you've got questions throughout, please can you put them into the chat function? Uh, and when you do that, if, if it's a question about, for example, the right to disconnect, uh, pop in right to disconnect and then your full question. If I don't get time to come back on questions today, we will look at collating those um, and seeing if we can put together a bit of a frequently asked questions. We have also prepared a, um, a full booklet white paper style on all of these changes and that will be sent out as well. So um, if you feel like we are sort of powering through, don't stress too much. There is more information to come as well. The intent of today is to have that, uh, I guess, that broad brush so that you understand what the changes are, what the impacts are, and at least have the awareness. And then we can dive into detail um, because we're conscious that not everything is relevant to every single business. So I'll also spend a little bit more time on the areas that I think are really relevant to more businesses uh, and less time on the ones that aren't. So I have to do a little disclaimer to start with. This is general information. It is not specific advice and it shouldn't override any uh, legal or specific advice that you are getting through any professional bodies or through Fair Work or anything like that. Um, this is our agenda for today. So we will, of course, cover the national minimum wage increase. Uh, there's a whole lot of legislation changes that we'll go through, closing loopholes, um, paid parental leave, job ad checks, fixed term contracts, discrimination, and then we're going to see if we've got some time to cover a couple of statistics that are coming out of fair work and interesting cases, as well as what we see is happening potentially next year, and hopefully it does slow down next year. So minimum wage increase, you've probably all heard already uh, that that was released on the 3rd of June. They actually came out really early with the percentage increase. So a 3.75% increase to the national minimum wage, which takes our national minimum wage up to $915.90 per week for a full-time employee or $24.10 per hour. Um, so that's the, that is the notification. We are still waiting, um, Nat and I just checked before, we are still waiting for the awards to get updated with the new rate. So we know that's national minimum wage. We just are waiting to see what level one to five actually does. We know it's going to be a 3.75% increase, but it can be that sort of rounding that happens at Fair Works and that can make a cent or two's difference, as well as what happens to the allowances and the award. Couple of key points when it comes to that national minimum wage. 
businesses all have an obligation to make sure that they are reviewing their pay rates to make sure they're compliant. Now that applies even when you have an enterprise agreement, it applies even when you pay employees a salary, you've still got that obligation to check and we see a, a common misperception is, oh well I, I actually pay my people above award rate or I pay a salary and therefore I don't need to check. You do at least need to stop and look at, are we compliant? And so we've got a really simple flow chart approach to that. Um, your first question of yourself, do you currently pay on or above award or minimum rates? Um, if you follow that bottom path, if you are just paying on the award, so the minimum rates in the award, then of course you will have an increase to pass on. If you pay above award rates already, then what you need to do is check. So you need to have a look at your contract of employment or your IFA or your enterprise agreement, whatever it is that specifies what your rates are. And you need to do, we call it a boot. Boot is an enterprise agreement term, but essentially you're doing the check to say, are they better off overall still? So if they're a salary or an all up hourly rate, you're doing the calculation to say, what's the base award rate? If I'm wrapping overtime in, what would I pay them for the amount of hours that they do? If I'm wrapping allowances in, what would I have to pay them for that? And you're running the figures to say, am I actually paying them enough for um, what I'm saying I'm wrapping in under the contract? If you are paying them enough, according to the new figures, then you can still opt to do an increase, but it's at your discretion. If you're not paying them enough anymore, then you must pass on an increase at least enough to bring them up to the compliant rate. It might not be 3.75%, it might be less. And look, our recommendation is always, particularly on roles that are um, more senior or performance-based, we love to see businesses break that attachment to the fair work increases because an increase that's given out on 1 July is seen by employees as a entitlement. It's just, I'm getting an increase because I have to. Whereas when you've got senior roles in particular that you know you want to uh, get that mentality of, um, we actually review your salary or your wage based on your performance, break that cycle, do your reviews earlier, make your increases based on performance and just make sure that they're enough to cover um, what the award rates are going to be. So that's your minimum wage increase. Uh, you also need to remember that you've got your superannuation increase as well. Uh, so from the 1st of July this year, it'll go from 11 to 11.5% and 1st of July next year, it'll bump to 12. And then that's the end of those increases that, have, that were announced a couple of years ago. 12% is the cap that the government was looking to move towards. So practical considerations, I've already covered this, check your contracts, your IFAs, your enterprise agreement rates to make sure that you are indeed paying um, as much as you need to do according to the award. Review any salaries and any all-inclusive hourly rates. Make sure your payroll is up to date. Um, I saw a notification just before that Fair Work has released the data that allows payroll companies to update their figures. So um, those should all push through automatically in terms of the different award levels, but just make sure that it does. Um, and my other key point on this is communication. So if you are doing an increase because of the fair work increase, tell your employees that you are. If you've done a review of their salary and you know they're compliant and you're not passing on an increase, communicate that to them. Communication is absolutely key at this point rather than leaving employees guessing as to what, you know, do I get an increase? At what point does it apply? All of those sorts of things. And just keep in mind, this increase applies from the first full pay period after 1 July. So if you have a pay period of a week that ends on the 4th of July, these new rates come into effect on the 5th of July for you. First full pay period after 1 July. So dates will vary for people depending on whether it's a weekly or a fortnightly pay cycle. All right, closing loopholes bill. This was a massive piece of legislation that came in um, last year and it's been sort of triggering or trickling through in terms of when it comes into play. There are a lot of different components to this and like I said, I'm going to cover some in a little bit more depth and others I'll... I'll give you the awareness of what's happening, but I won't go into in a ton of detail. 
the right to disconnect is one of the biggest kickers. It has been all over the media. It's getting talked about by businesses. Um, I believe it's getting misrepresented uh, in terms of what it is because they're dubbing it the right to disconnect and they're saying it means an employee can refuse to have connection outside of work hours. It is not that simple. This legislation is a right for employees to refuse unreasonable attempts to contact outside of work hours and the legislation prevents an employer from disciplining or disadvantaging an employee for reasonably refusing. Now, this word reasonable seems to be Fair Work's favourite term, and it really does apply in this case. This is not legislation that is a carte blanche, you cannot contact an employee, which is, I think, what it's getting sort of put out as in the media. Um, it is that reasonable factor. An employee can reasonably refuse unreasonable contact. And there's a whole bunch of factors that Fair Work is going to look at when it comes to what is reasonable. So they will look at things like um, the reason for the contact or the attempted contact, how that contact is made and the level of disruption that it causes the employee, um, the extent to which the employee is compensated. So it could be money, could be non-monetary compensation if they're required to remain available or be on call or on standby outside of hours. It'll look at the nature of the employee's role and their level of responsibility. So, for example, you would think that it is quite reasonable that a manager might be contacted a half hour before a shift is due to start if an employee is ringing to say, hey, I can't make it in today, I'm sick. Um, so that nature of the role and level of responsibility is taken into account. Um, and also the employee's personal circumstances. So that can include family or caring responsibility. So employees may be in a position to communicate, look, um, you know, between six and eight is the time when I have to be cooking dinner, taking care of my kids, getting them bathed and into bed. That's my difficult time. I really can't take calls during that time. Um, if there is a dispute on this, so if an employee is refusing contact, there can be a dispute, which is either the employee saying, this is unreasonable, stop doing it, or it could be the employer saying, no, this is actually quite reasonable you need to stop refusing. Um, so when that happens, there is a requirement in the legislation that there's an attempt to resolve it at the workplace level first. If that fails, then either party can make an application to fair work. Um, and they're applying for an order and that order can either be stop refusing, so telling the employee to stop refusing the contact because it is reasonable, or it could be to the employer to stop attempting unreasonable contact. Um, now, there's no penalties here unless an order is breached. So first step is order. Second step, if either party then um, breaks that order, that's when penalties can apply. The other thing to be aware of is that potential adverse action claim. So if an employee reasonably refuses contact, and the employer disciplines or disadvantages them, then an employee can also make an application for unfair uh, for adverse action. Um, and that is also dealt with by the Fair Work Commission. So at a really practical level, what we want to be looking at doing is uh, reviewing your position description. So we think it's actually really important in your PDs to start to think about, right, for this level role, what is it that's actually reasonable? Like I said, for a manager, it may well be reasonable that um, we need you to be available to be contacted one hour either side of the shift that you're supervising because an employee might need to call you. For someone who is your IT support, it might be reasonable for them um, to be contactable or to need to do certain hours outside of normal hours because they have to do system upgrades. Um, think too about things like, you know, we've got clients who are part of a um, international business. And so for their PDs, they're writing into it. It's actually um, part of your role to be available for some out of hours meetings because it needs to be with people in an entirely different time zone. This is where you need to start to think through the unique components of your business and what could be reasonable. You also want to take a look at your contracts of employment to make sure that if there's any really specific requirements, like you must be on call or you must be on standby, that that is written in. And if possible, be specific about 
allocation of remuneration to that um, because that's all going to help if you get into that kind of dispute around is it reasonable or not. The other thing, if we sort of flip that on its head, because I think it's important that employers are saying what is reasonable and what can we expect of you, flip that around as well, though, and think about should we be creating or are there ways for us to create that culture of disconnecting? Um, because actually, we are getting worse and worse at disconnecting. It impacts our mental health. We're not taking downtime. We've all got, you know, these mobile phones that are constantly digging at us even after, after hours. You know, there are so many things that keep us connected, which means that we're not getting downtime. So um, look at it as well as, do we actually have a problem? Is this something that we should be looking at? How do we help people to disconnect really reasonably? Um, you know, so things like training to managers and employees around what is reasonable, what isn't, how do we help you to disconnect, have a look at your systems and practices. So, um, you know, are there things, I know some managers we talk to who do contact employees regularly out of hours and when you sort of question it and go, do you actually need to? Well, no, it's just that I didn't get to that during the day and so I ring them afterwards. All right, let's have a look at how we, how we maybe can reduce that. Have a look at your apps and your access. There's so many businesses that use things like Teams and different chat functions. And, and because they've got it on the people's on their mobile phones, again, dinging all the time. Is there a way that we can stop that happening? Um, and things too like cross-skilling. You know, if you've got one person who is the only person that happens to know how to run a piece of machinery uh, and because of that, they tend to get called quite often to check in on how to use it when they're not there, is there a way that we can cross skill so that someone else is able to help? So I think this is a, my take on this is um, the ability to disconnect is absolutely important. I can't believe that we live in a society where we need a piece of legislation to tell us that or a piece of legislation that tries to put rules around it and we kind of need to navigate because I think um, we still need really good communication and connectivity between employer and employee. We need to be careful that this isn't taken in the wrong way and we go too far the other way. So that's our right to disconnect. Wage theft is the next topic. Now, this is um, a new piece of legislation that came in with this bill. And essentially, if you... <laughs> you remember we've got penalties that apply so if we um, if we underpay someone if we accidentally get their classification wrong and we pay them incorrectly um, and fair work comes in and does an audit they can apply penalties to an organization and to an individual for that mistake this takes it to the next level wage theft and I hate the term by the way um, but that's what it's being dubbed Wage theft occurs where an employer intentionally engages in conduct that results in failure to pay entitlements. So this is businesses uh, intentionally saying, I know that you're a level three and that I should be paying you $27 an hour, but I'm only going to pay you $23. Um, it can also be things like I'm going to deduct things that I'm not entitled to deduct. So it's very intentional conduct. Now, these um, penalties and um, punishments can be applied to businesses. It can also be applied to individuals. And there's sort of tentacles that go out from it for individuals. So it can be things like you're a party to it, um, you're complicit in it, as in you know it's happening and you don't do anything to stop it. Um, you're part of procuring so procuring someone else to commit. There's, there's a bunch of different things that come with the fact that this is now a criminal activity. Um, it is not designed to cover genuine mistakes or inadvertent payroll mistakes. Businesses who are purposely doing the right thing uh, and trying to make sure that they are paying correctly, this isn't designed to trip them up. Um, it is designed to deal with people who are intentionally doing the wrong thing. Um, it is quite severe. So um, the courts would have to find fault to the criminal standard, which is beyond reasonable doubt. So there actually has to be proof of intention to uh, do this. But if that happens, it can be up to 10 years imprisonment or uh, fines, which are the greater of three times the underpayment amount. So if you think about the amount that you didn't give the employee times up by three and multiple if it's across multiple employees or penalty units. 
and that's 1.65 million for individuals uh, or 8.25 million for body corporates, businesses. So we're talking about some pretty big numbers here in terms of the penalties that apply for wage theft. In terms of what you can do, and this is what you should be doing anyway, um, your annual wage check. So whenever Fair Work releases their new figures, you're doing that check we talked about earlier to make sure that you are paying correctly. Um, it's really important to, to know your industrial instruments. So know which award applies to you or which enterprise agreement. Make sure that you're checking your positions against the classifications. This is one area that can be um, a common mistake is that um, we're not actually looking and realising that, oh, hang on, that, that role is actually a level three, not a level two or not a level one. And the other thing we recommend is keep records of your decisions. So we do this kind of check for businesses all the time, the wage compliances check, um, and we produce a report that says, you know, based on all of these factors, we believe that you are paying sufficient or based on all of these factors, this person needs to be on this rate of pay. Now, a business keeps that kind of report to show we've done everything reasonable to make sure we're paying correctly. If they've got it wrong, it doesn't protect them from the back pay claim, but it protects them from the um, any kind of claim that they have intentionally underpaid because they can show that we've done everything reasonable to try to pay correctly. So um, the next one, same job, same pay. Now this may apply to um, some of you. This applies when we use labour hire agency employees. And I know that that's fairly common in this industry. We think they did a typo when they wrote this because it comes into effect from the 1st of November, 2024. Businesses or, or applicants can already lodge an application now, but the order, and an order can be made now, but the order doesn't take place or take effect until 1 November. And orders are already, or applications are already going in. Um, Fair Work is already dealing with I think about a dozen orders for this. So in a nutshell, this is um, an order or a request for a regulated labour hire arrangement order. I can't even pronounce the acronym of that, um, but it's there, RLHAO. Um, it relates to those labour hire agency employees. And in a nutshell, what it is, is if I've got, I'm the business, I'm the host employer and I engage people through a labour hire agency. If I've got an enterprise agreement in place that sets my pay rates for my employees and I engage labour hire employees, but I pay them at a lesser rate because they're award based and so they're getting less than my employees, an application can be made to say, hold on, you need to pay these labour hire agency employees the same as what you pay your employees for doing the same job, same job, same pay. Um, and that application can be brought by a really wide range of parties. It could be a union. It could be one of the employees from the labour hire agency. It could be the labour hire agency. It could be the employer. It could be one of your employees who is engaged directly through you. It's really quite broad how it can be brought. And Fair Work Commission essentially looks at it and says, right, is this the right thing to do? Is it fair that employees brought in as labour hire contractors are paid the same amount? There are a bunch of additional components to this that are essentially stopping businesses from being able to take action to kind of avoid um, that requirement. And once an order is made, it actually sticks to the host employer. Um, so you can't, for example, go, right, I've had that labour, the RLHAO um, made when I engage people through that labour hire agency. So I'll stop that and I'll, I'll start to get them from a different agency. That won't work. You have to let the other agency know that you've got this order in place um, in your business. If you go to tender um, for labour hire agencies, you need to advise that there may be an RLHAO that applies um, depending on the role. So this can have um, quite a bit of implication if you are engaging labour hire employees at different rates. It's not two way. So there's no, the order doesn't go on the labour hire agency. It goes on the, the host employer um, and it's not applicable to small business. So that less than 15 employee benchmark, um, you can't bring a RLHAO against one of those small businesses. 
So I guess in terms of the, the impact or the what to do at a really practical level, if you do, if you're a large business and you employ labor, hire workers, um, have a look at, are you actually paying them at the same rate as what your employees are? And if you aren't, it doesn't mean that you automatically have to increase them, but just be aware that there's a risk there that um, someone does lodge that kind of an order and you may need to. So in terms of your financial implications, being aware that that could come into play. All right, uh, workplace delegate rights. Um, this one I actually don't see as a massive change, um, to be honest. Uh, what it is, is it's, it's writing the right into awards and a requirement for them to go into the enterprise agreement, but they're rights that have largely already been there. This is just bringing it into the awards. So it's the right for a union delegate to have reasonable communication, access to the workplace and facilities and paid training during normal work hours. And the employer isn't allowed to unreasonably fail or refuse to deal with that union delegate, knowingly or recklessly make false or misleading representations or unreasonably block exercise of rights of that delegate. Um, so like I said, not a massive change. Um, and most of the members that we talk to aren't um, unionised. So I don't think it has a massive impact um, in this industry, but just something to be aware of. Um, Fair Work also has some additional powers now to allow union entry without the 24-hour notice period that's currently required, but it's still only in very specific circumstances. Uh, small business redundancy. Um, again, I don't know this one will impact a lot of businesses, but just good to be aware of. So historically, um, small businesses, so less than 15 employees, uh, you still have to go through the consultation process for a redundancy, but you don't have to pay redundancy payments that are included in the NES. What will happen, and, and sorry, and historically, um, what could happen was if you were a large business, more than 15 employees, but you kind of downsized over a period of a few months through that, um, you know, insolvency process, the employees who were left at the end, you your payroll people, your bookkeepers, some of your core managers who you needed there right through to the end, they were no longer entitled to a redundancy payment because the employer had become a small business through that process. This legislation is basically just changing that to say, if you were a large business and over a period of six months downsized through liquidation or insolvency, um, so that you became a small business, even those employees remaining are then going to be entitled to redundancy pay. Um, so it's just preventing that strategy, which some businesses did use, which was, right, let's just, let's downsize a little bit, get us to less than 15, and then we know that we don't have to pay redundancies after that. And that comes into play for any terminations that occurred after the 15th of December last year. All right, protection against discrimination for employees subject to family and domestic violence. So if you remember last year, if I've got my time right, um, the family and domestic violence leave came into play uh, and that came in across the board. This legislation that came into effect in December last year uh, is just strengthening uh, the protection for employees who are subject to family and domestic violence so that we can't have discriminatory terms in either modern awards or enterprise agreements. Uh, employers can't discriminate against an employee on the basis of being subject to family and domestic violence. And it is a protected attribute for general protections. Essentially, this is the same as any other kind of leave. We, um, you know, the access to personal leave, if you are sick, it is a protected attribute. Um, there are this is this isn't something that is a grand scale change. It is just being aware as an employer that we need to be um, cautious in navigating when we have issues in the workplace that might be related to family and domestic violence leave. It does not mean that we can't appropriately manage situations because sometimes 
FDV means that we do have, you know, that the side effects of this can be poor performance, poor attendance, um, you know, abandonment of employment, all of those sorts of things that can happen in that setting as well as other settings. It doesn't stop us from being able to take action. It just means we need to be careful that we are, we're dealing with the behaviours or the impact, not the fact that it's because of family and domestic violence. All right. I can't see any questions coming through the chat yet. I'm keeping an eye out. I'm hoping that doesn't mean people aren't able to keep up with this, with this pace. Um, employee versus contractor. This one is coming in on the 26th of August. Um, so it is not yet in play. We're two months away from it. Um, and this is an interesting one. Um, for those of you who follow this stuff, uh, over the last couple of years, we've had a couple of pieces of case law, personnel contracting and JAMSEC were two of the main uh, decisions, which, which essentially when it came to this concept of employee versus contractor said contract is king. So whatever your contract of employment states, that is what is, oh, no, sorry, not a contract of employment. If you have a contract or agreement, that is what applies, regardless of what it is in practice. This legislation overturns that again. So, and it takes it back to what it was before these cases. And essentially what it says is um, the relationship between worker and business will be determined by ascertaining the real substance, practical reality, and true nature of the relationship. So it will still look at the terms of the contract, but it will also look at the behaviours or the way in which the working relationship occurs when it says, are they an employee or are they a contractor? The reason this is important is employees get things that contractors don't. So employees accrue leave if they're permanent, um, they are paid superannuation um, and that's only in limited circumstances for contractors. Uh, we pay their payroll tax um, for an employee. We don't do that for a contractor. Uh, we have to meet minimum award standards for an employee. It's slightly different requirements for a contractor. So it is different the way that they are engaged. If we say someone is a contractor and they are not, we're at risk of what's called sham contracting arrangements and that can attract penalties. It can also attract back pay in the sense of um, giving that contractor um, access to what they would have otherwise been entitled to as an employee. So things to do here is um, check that both your contract that engage as a contractor and your practices are consistent with that contractor style of engagement. Um, now, I think about a month ago, maybe two months ago, we put a free resource on the QFVG uh, shop, which was a, which was a contractor versus employee self-assessment. Um, now, it is not you have to tick every single box of the contractor side of the coin, but it is looking at on large is this person engaged as a contractor? So um, if you engage contractors and want to do a check, jump on the QFVG shop site and you'll be able to download that resource for free. It's also a really interesting little double twist in this one. They've introduced this concept of a high income threshold for contractors. And that figure is yet to be told. We don't know yet what that is, but we expect it'll be something like the employee high income threshold. Now, if a contractor is paid more than that high income threshold, they can opt out of this legislation. They can say, no, it's okay. I realise that I'm probably engaged very similarly to an employee, but I'm still happy to be a contractor. But then they can revoke the opt out. <laughs> so they can opt to opt out of the opt out, which is just fairly crazy in my mind and is going to create a whole lot of confusion. Um, but that's what it is. That's how it has been written. Um, the other element relating to contractors is that there is now some legislation around um, unfair contractual terms. So um, with this one, previously, if you were a contractor, you had to apply through um, you know, a different legal system if you felt like there was anything unfair in that contract. Fair work had nothing to do with it. Fair work now is going to be able to have some power around 
contract or agreements. Um, and essentially what they're looking at is, uh, are the terms of the contract fair or unfair? When this comes in front of them, they have the option to set aside all or part of a contract. So they can say, look, that particular clause there is unfair on the worker, therefore it's out. Um, and they've also got the authority to amend or vary a part of a services contract. Um, what they can't do is order compensation. But I think what they are going to look at in this space is, um, is still going to be things like the amount of payment that a, that a contractor receives to make sure that it is still fair in line with what they would have otherwise gotten if they were an employee. So this will be interesting to see. Um, it doesn't come into effect until August. So it'll be interesting to see what happens in this space in terms of, you know, how many contractors actually do start to lodge for unfair contractual terms through the Fair Work Commission. Definition of a casual employee also changed. And I need some coffee. So this one also comes into effect from August. Uh, and what this, I actually quite like this one is sort of clarifying um, the definition because it seems to go backwards and forwards depending on the case law. The big focus now is part A on the screen. The employment relationship is characterised by an absence of a firm advanced commitment to continuing an indefinite work. Um, and so this is wording that you kind of need to tattoo on all of your material when it comes to a casual. Um, the second part of it is what's always been. So they're entitled to that casual loading or a specific rate of pay that applies to casuals under the instrument. So it's not a massive, massive change, but it is saying this is now the definition and our emphasis is on um, that no firm advanced commitment. So at a really practical level, we recommend that you review your casual contracts to make sure that that wording is in there. You are a casual employee. There is no firm advanced commitment to continuing an indefinite work. Your hours will be determined on a roster by roster basis. You need to tell us what your hours of what your hours of availability are. Again, there is a um, a free resource on the QFVG shop, which is uh, a bit of a helpful guide around how to make sure your employees are genuinely um, casual. We are also going to be updating very soon the uh, contracts and those sorts of things that are on the shop. So this wording will be in the new contract template that will be in the QFVG shop. The other bit related to casual is a change to casual conversion. So if you think back, I want to say two, three years ago, um, this concept of casual conversion came into play where we had to let employees know that at six months or 12 months, you've got the right to request casual conversion. And uh, there was all sorts of obligations on the employer to educate the employee and make sure that they were aware of it. They've changed this and I think they've changed it for the better because essentially what they've said is actually um, this is all about an employee's choice to request. Again, I think that the terminology that is being used around this, they talk about the right um, and casual employees' right to convert. It's not a right to convert. It is a right to request. And so the way it works now is we need to give employees their um, casual information statement from Fair Work, and I'll cover that in a second as to when you have to give it to them. But essentially an employee can come to you as a casual and request to convert to permanent if they believe they're no longer casual, if they've been with you for a period of six months if you're a large employer or 12 months if you're a small employer and they're not currently disputing their status. So if they've only just lodged a request and you've said no within the last six months, they can't just turn around and lodge again. In essence, it means that they can request it every six months. Um, when you get that request in to say, I'd like to go permanent, you do have to consider it. You can only refuse it on reasonable grounds. And if you're going to refuse it or if you're going to go back and say, look, we can't do it the way you want, but we can do this, you do have to consult first before you make a decision. Um, if there is a dispute, so if an employee requests it, you say no, then the employee can take it to the Fair Work Commission. But again, the Fair Work Commission is going to look at, has there been an attempt to resolve that internally first? An employee can't just go straight to Fair Work and say, I want to go permanent. 
This is not, like I said, a right to conversion. It's a right to request. It's also not a never ending cycle. Um, they can only request in practice every six months. So it's not something that you are going to have to deal with um, non-stop, let's say. So the casual information statement that you need to give, um, obviously you wanna make sure that your contracts are all clearly casual. When you employ a casual employee, you need to give them at the point of commencement or as soon as possible um, after that, the casual information statement, which is on the Fair Work website. Uh, then if you are, and this one always trips me up, so let me make sure I get it right. If you are a large employer, you need to reissue that casual information statement after six months of employment and then every 12 months, so on their anniversary. If you are a small employer, you give it at commencement, you give it at their 12 month anniversary and I don't believe you have to give it again after that. So it's less um, administrative burden on a small employer. I do think this is an improvement to what it was previously because previously you had to, um, if you had a casual employee, you still had to give the fair work information statement, but then you also had to tell them either at the six or 12 months mark, hey, you've got a right to request casual conversion now. Do you want to do that? And to protect yourself, you were trying to capture all of that sort of thing in writing. So this, I think this is a good change that it's now an employee's choice to make the request as opposed to you needing to, to tell them that they can. The other practical implementation that we're suggesting is if you've got um, like a grievance dispute handling style policy in place, add a little line in that, doesn't need to be a lot, but add a line in that that sort of references the, if there are disputes around a casual conversion request, we will deal with it in a similar manner to dispute handling. That way, if there is a grievance or if there is a dispute about this and Fair Work says, have you gone through your appropriate internal channels, you as the employer can show we do have a channel and the employee hasn't done it, they've got to come back through us first. All right, paid parental leave. Um, with this one, this isn't actually a fair work change. This is a paid parental leave from the government, but it just impacts on how we, um, how we handle our uh, people who are going on parental leave. So it takes effect from 1st of July this year and it increases each year for the next, for, well, for three times, essentially. Um, so we are increasing paid parental leave by two weeks each year. Uh, and so I think from, it'll go to 20 weeks um, this July, then it'll go to 22 to 24 to 26. So we want to reach that 26 mark. Um, and again, this is this is paid by the government. This is not employers having to pay. The flexible parental leave days will also increase. Um, so from 1st of July, there's 100 days flexible uh, leave days. Now think about these flexible leave days as previously you took a six month block and that was it. Um, a, about a year or two ago, it came in this concept of flexible parental leave days where towards the end normally of your um, of your period of parental leave, you had some flexibility around, right, I'm going to come back to work a couple of days a week or, um, you know, but I'm going to treat the end of that period quite flexibly to sort of ease my way back into work. But it was only a certain number of days that you could do that for. So that's also going to gradually increase. The government also in their last budget did commit to paying um, superannuation on top of paid parental leave. So that is new. Again, not a cost directly to employers, um, but they will be starting to pay superannuation on top of paid parental leave. So no direct cost to employer. Uh, I think the, the key thing is just to be aware that particularly for those employees who um, who are potentially impacted by the finances in terms of when they have to come back to work. Um, obviously, you know, getting two weeks extra of paid parental leave means that they will maybe be a little bit more likely to extend that leave longer than they otherwise would have. If you've got parental leave policies in place, I would just update them to make sure that you reflect that, but maybe update it to be... Um, a little bit more generic to say that it is just in line with um, the paid parental leave from the government. Otherwise you'll have to go back in and update it every 12 months to reflect the new figures. Job ad checks. Um, this one's actually an interesting one. 
the new legislation that came in, um, and this was part of the uh, Better Pay Secure Jobs Bill, and essentially what it did, did was it gave the Fair Work Commission powers to look at employers who were advertising roles at a rate that was not compliant, so a rate that was below what an employee should be paid under their instrument, their modern award, for example. Um, and so Fair Work could start to scrutinise and there was a workforce set up. So they started to scrutinise, right, there's that advert. It looks like it's a horticultural employee, um, probably looks like it should be a level one. What's the pay rate that it's been advertised at? Oh, gosh, that maybe it's a bit low. Um, and we actually did have members and other clients contacting us and saying, hey, I've just gotten this letter from Fair Work that says we've noticed that you have potentially advertised a role at a, at a rate that is non-compliant. So they are actually acting on it. Um, nothing further came from that. We haven't seen um, anyone being further scrutinised or penalised for it. But penalties can be applied if Fair Work decides that that is what is needed. So really practical level again on this one, um, make sure your position descriptions are up to date so that when you advertise a role, you're actually advertising it accurately in terms of what the duties of the role are. Have a look at what the uh, award coverage and classification is for that position and just make sure, you know, when you advertise on SEEK, you can put in your band of your hourly rate or your band of your salary. Just err on the side of caution in terms of making sure that it is enough to cover that award classification level, not um, lower than, which can be a little bit tricky because when you're doing a band, and particularly if you're looking for, say, junior employees, you know, the band doesn't always allow you to start at $24.34. It You might start at $24, um, but just make sure that you are being careful with what you do uh, advertise it at even when your rates are hidden because you, you often can, well, you have to put the rates in, but you can say, I don't want that to show on the ad. Um, there are ways to still see what the rate is or to know what your band is. So it can still be discovered that way. Here's an interesting one. I was very surprised when we first heard about businesses actually getting letters from the flow about it. Fixed term contracts, I suspect this one doesn't apply too much, so I won't spend a lot of time on this, but essentially a fixed term contract is where you engage an employee for a temporary position. So they're an employee, they're not a contractor, but you're saying, look, it's a 12 month period to cover maternity leave, or it's six months to cover this particular project, or you know, 24 months because we've got this set funding that we're going to use for this position. So that's what your fixed term contracts are. The new legislation that came into play last year basically said a fixed term contract cannot extend more than two years and it cannot ex cannot be renewed more than twice or to extend before uh, over two years. Now, there are some exceptions to the rule on this, um, which are very, I think, very practical rules, like if it's attached to specific government funding and that funding might be for a three-year period, then you're allowed to do it. Or if it's a trainee or an apprentice role that goes for four years, then you're allowed to do it. So there's a couple of um, a couple of exclusions to that rule. But in general, you need to be careful if you're engaging people on a temporary basis that you don't just keep those rolling contracts going and thinking it's okay, you're safe. Discrimination. So this one came in late last year as well. Um, and there's been quite a bit of media around this. What has happened in this space is we've always had to have policies in place. We've always had to act on instances if there has been sexual harassment in the workplace or bullying in the workplace. The terminology that came in with this is a positive duty. So there's a positive duty for employers to take reasonable measures to eliminate sexual harassment sex-based harassment, sex discrimination, hostile work environments on a sexual level um, and any related victimisation. Now, this is another place that Fair Work's favourite terminology of reasonable comes into play in that it's reasonable measures to eliminate. Um, the big change with the positive duty is that historically businesses could say, Look, we've got a we've got a policy that says sexual harassment's unacceptable. We've got a grievance process that handles it if someone makes a complaint. 
Um, you know, we even do some training to make sure that people know what sexual harassment is. Good. We are doing the right thing. The positive duty to eliminate means that we need to go a bit further than that. But it is what's reasonable and it's what's reasonable based on size of organisation, maturity, those sorts of things. Um, and they put out a lot of content around this. There's a, there's a bunch of um, resources that are available. Uh, so there, there's a lot of help around this. But at a, a practical level, a couple of things that we suggest is do make sure that your policies are up to date, including the new terminology. A lot of policies we're reading don't have um, the terminology like sex discrimination and sex-based harassment. Again, we are going through the process of updating all of that to go into the QFVG shop. Um, definitely providing training to employees and to managers around, you know, for your managers, what are your obligations? If you see something happening or you have some concerns, what should you be doing? Not just waiting for a grievance to come in. If there's a grievance, what's your process? Making sure that you've got that um, well set up. Making sure your managers know how to respond. Um, and then some of the positive duty things that you can do are things like surveys in your workplace. Um, asking the question, does this stuff happen here? Have you seen, have you been impacted by sexual harassment, sex discrimination, workplace bullying, those sorts of things. Um, doing risk assessments, similar to what you would do for other workplace health and safety style risk assessments. Um, and things like having an employee assistance program or EAP in place or other support avenues. Those are all extra measures that are now going to be um, potential things that help to show that you are doing everything reasonable to eliminate. C14 decision. This one, um, we I know that this has gone out through the QFVG uh, IR alerts or newsletters, um, and we've written a more in-depth summary on this as well. The concept behind this C14 decision, so C14 is this term that is used. It comes out of the Manufacturing and Associated Industry Award. It is a term that is used to describe that pay rate which is below the national minimum wage. So last year when 1 July pay rate increases came out, for the first time ever, the national minimum wage was higher than some of the lowest rates within awards. And the Hort Award is impacted by this. So I remember we fielded a bunch of phone calls last year around this um, because what happened was level one is at a lower hourly rate than the national minimum wage, which you're not actually, you know, normally national minimum wage is exactly that. You don't get to go below it. Um, at the time, Fair Work said, look, um, our intention with these C14 rates, level one for Hort Award, is that they're only designed as a training rate for a limited period of time and employees should be stepping to the next level pretty soon after they've started. So we're going to deal with that. They've dealt with it now. They've come out with this C14 decision. We don't yet know when it's going to come into play. Um, and at the moment, they keep talking about their provisional views. So there's still some back and forth happening on this. Um, but essentially, the idea of these rates only applying for a limited period of time is very definitely set in concrete. Um, and so what they've done is they've gone through, there's something like 70 awards that are impacted by this. There were 70 awards that had their minimum rate below national minimum wage. They've gone through every single one of those 70 awards and said, what do we think needs to happen with this award? Uh, and so for the Hort Award, it has come out as um, the level one rate can apply for a period of three months in the industry before they have to move to level two. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, what we need to establish still on this, and I think I saw a question pop in before about this, um, what I'm still searching for or waiting for the clarification on is when they say three months industry experience, are we talking about port industry in its breadth? Are we talking about the apple industry and the three months restarts for the potato industry? I suspect they're going to go broad, by the way, um, but we don't have that clarity yet. Um, what we also don't know is what does three months equal? Is it uh, 13 weeks times 38 hours a week? Is it just three calendar months from the date of commencement? 
you know, how do we know what three months is? And the third bit that we want clarity on is um, around what about experience with previous employers? So if I come to you as a future employee and I say, look, I've, I've done six months at the farm down the road, am I already straight on to level two? Um, you know, does that previous experience count? Um, and so that you're aware in a lot of the awards, that previous experience with other employers does count. Um, but this is all stuff that we really need some clarity on um, because at the moment we are a little bit blind. My fear is that Fair Work is going to go broad, as in whole of Hort, you know, three months experience applies no matter where you got your experience. Um, I'm worried that that's where they're going to head, but we don't know yet. We need to, to watch and wait in that space. The things that you can do around that now are already know your employee tenure. So already start to have a look at of my casual employees, who do I know is going to be um, sitting at that three months experience when, if this comes into play on the 1st of January, um, you know that it is three months under the Hort Award um, and start to think about what's the financial implication of that. If I have a whole bunch of employees that increase to level two on the 1st of January, 2025, what's that mean in terms of my budget, uh, my, my expenses budget? You know, is there something I need to already do around um, my contracts, my supply contracts that are going to help with that? So I think this one's going to have a, um, a big impact. What's happened in the hoard industry previously is because level one was described quite distinct to level two, we could argue, no, those duties are level one and therefore they remain at level one. Um, part of this decision was Fair Work is saying we're going to grab that bit that says this is what a level one employee does and it's going to stay in level one but we're going to replicate it in level two and they're saying that was always the intent that a level two could do level one but we're just going to pop it across there as well so that it's really clear. Um, the other bit we are watching and waiting on with this one and we probably won't gain clarity until there's a challenge is what does this mean for enterprise agreements? So for a lot of businesses who have an enterprise agreement, it will list its classifications and its classification descriptions in the enterprise agreement. Um, my experience is it very often uh, mirrors the horticultural award. Um, and so we don't know yet whether or not Fair Work is going to say, right, this has to uh, then apply to those EAs as well. Uh, or does it not? How much do the descriptions map across? Um, that's going to be a watch and wait space as well. Just some interesting stats um, from Fair Work, uh, unfair dismissal applications. Um, and the important part here for me is the comparison between the actual applications and the settled. So you can see on the left-hand side there, this is divided up by month, but we're getting um, somewhere around three and a half to 4,000 applications every quarter for unfair dismissal. Consistently, 90% of those are classed as settled without decision. Now, settled without decision essentially means it never went to arbitration. And if you've ever been through this process, what happens is employee lodges an unfair dismissal claim, employer gets a notification. Um, employer then writes their response to say, here's why we believe that it's not an unfair dismissal claim, um, puts that to fair work, and then there is this voluntary conciliation. And the conciliation essentially is where a fair work representative um, has the employee and the employer on the phone. Um, they listen to both sides very briefly. They tic-tac between the two, but their goal is settlement. Um, now, the problem with that mentality of a goal of settlement is that settlement often means that the employer pays some sort of additional money to the employee. And when you look at 90% of unfair dismissal cases have settled without decision, there might be some of those that are settled without any money changing hands. There might be some of those that the employee withdraws on. But I believe, you don't know because that information is private, but I believe the vast majority of those settled cases um, are essentially where an employer has paid something additional. Now, that might be a week, might be two to four weeks, 
rarely does it go beyond that, but the cap is six months um, of pay. The thing I really hate about this is the settlement mentality. Um, we have participated in multiple conciliations and unfortunately um, there is very much a, uh, a nudge <laughs> for, hey, look, think about it. You don't want to go to arbitration. It's a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of cost. Um, if you just give the employee another couple of weeks pay, then we can all agree to go away. Um, we think that sucks in our professional <laughs> terminology and opinion. Um, we don't agree with that settlement mentality at all. We actually think that employers should be following the right process. They should absolutely be fair and reasonable when it comes to terminating an employee. But if they've been thorough in their process, they have been fair, they've been diligent, they've done everything right and they've got reasonable grounds to terminate, why should we have to pay something extra because an employee lodged a claim? And the fee for an employee to lodge a claim has just increased to the grand total of, I think it was $87.50. Like it costs nothing for an employee to lodge a claim. Um, so what have they got to lose if they know they can get a couple of weeks extra pay? Um, and that the amount that they pay, I'm pretty sure, comes back to them too if it settles. So it's really low risk for the employee and a whole lot of heartache and a whole lot of effort for the employer. So we actually think we need to um, push hard to change that. The reinstatement orders and orders on the right-hand side. So of the unfair dismissal applications that go in, keep in mind, three and a half to 4,000 a quarter um, result in, um, you know, max of 50 orders. Um, and an order then means it's gone through to arbitration. And so that biggest one that you can see there, there's been 48 orders, which will be an order for payment and three reinstatements. Now, reinstatement is the worst possible outcome because you don't want the employee back in once that bad blood has passed, you know, around, around you terminating them and then uh, taking legal action about it. It's pretty hard to get back to a good working relationship. Um, but still, this puts in perspective of all those unfair dismissal claims, it is very, very small number that actually go through to that arbitration stage. Other interesting statistics, general protection applications. So these are claims about discrimination, um, dismissal related. Again, um, you are looking at um, over a thousand a quarter. So this is employees saying not unfair dismissal. They're saying I've been dismissed because of a protected attribute. So it might be something like because I'm pregnant, um, because I'm a member of a union, because I believe in this political party, because I've disclosed my sexual preference any of those discriminatory factors um, or because I've claimed a workplace right and that two to 300 are non-dismissal related. So this is people who are still employed and saying I've been disadvantaged because of one of these protected attributes. So it's still a fair amount of, um, of figures when you think about fair work having to deal with these and look through them. In terms of um, enterprise agreements, couple of stats on um, how these are tracking. So you can see there over the quarters, um, so July, September last year, there was 1,131 applications for agreements, 1,500 October to December and just under 1,000 for January to March. So they've absolutely dropped off again this quarter. Um, the beige column in the middle means it's an approved EA and the darker column is an, it's an EA approved with undertaking. So that just means it wasn't approved as it was put forward. It was approved because the employer came back and said, okay, fair work, we'll do an undertaking that will increase rates or we'll do an undertaking that this clause of the award applies that you were concerned about. Um, so those statistics are just interesting. We're watching them just because of, you know, the number of zombie agreements that cancelled out at the end of last year and seeing what does that mean. And I think that's what's caused that real peak in the number that were lodged October to December last year. Um, our last ones, and I'll, I will uh, be a bit selective on these. Um, again, we've got the information in the booklet that we'll send out, but um, interesting case law, public holidays. Um, this one is reiterating a decision that was already made. So BHP already had a decision lodged on this. They asked for um, the right to challenge and um, the highest courts have said, no, 
you're not going to challenge. So it just means they've reinforced the decision. And essentially the decision is you cannot require an employee to work a public holiday, you can request. And an employee can reasonably refuse. So previously there were employers that were saying, do you know what, you just have to work a public holiday. It's a requirement of your role. Um, the courts have been really clear, we don't get to do that. Um, it is a request to work. What it means is we need to be clear on that um, in PDs when we're interviewing all of those sorts of things to try to remove that situation where we agree with an employee that they will and they subsequently say, no, I'm not going to. Um, it's just going to be a little bit of tricky navigation around that. Um, this template one, um, it was an employer who relied on template letters provided by a HR software program. Um, and the risk to this, because we know there's a lot of businesses who do this or they download something off of the internet um, that they think, oh, that looks like it could be right, um, but they're not actually tailoring it to suit their business. So um, the warning in this one is you need to make sure that even when you download templates or you've got templates available to you, that you are actually making sure that um, a, they are relevant to your business and B, that you then follow them. Because if you've got a policy, for example, that says we will do these three steps, you're expected to do those three steps. Um, in this instance, what happened was um, there was an employee um, was warned about her conduct. Uh, so the employer actually did a bunch of good things. What they never did was told the employee that failure to improve her performance could lead to dismissal. Um, now, that wasn't in the template letters that they had that were performance management letters, warning letters, and subsequently the dismissal. So at no point was that employee really clearly told, if you don't improve, it could end in termination. And so Fair Work essentially said, reason for termination, fair. Uh, process, not fair, because the employee wasn't aware um, so just a, a learning for employers to A, make sure you do tell an employee that failure to improve could lead to termination, but B, make sure that um, templates are brilliant. We love templates, um, but advice with it is really helpful. Um, this case came through, um, I think, um, it, it, well, it, it's, it continues on. I think they're still challenging it at the moment, but the initial decision was made. What happened with this one um, was Aldi had policy where they said employees have to arrive at work 10 to 15 minutes before their shift starts because there's stuff that they've got to do to be ready to commence work. Now, that's not an uncommon thing for businesses to say, but what Fair Work found in this instance was that the things that Aldi was saying they had to do were actually work tasks. So it was things like um, they had to pick up and do uh, pre-start checks on their equipment, safety checks and pre-start checks on forklift, um, forklifts that they needed to use, that sort of thing. So this is not the, hey, um, if you want to have a coffee, say good day to your workmates, then arrive 10 minutes early to have that chat and be ready to sit at your desk and get started at 8 a.m. This was come 15 minutes early, start to do some jobs so that you're doing your job, <laughs> you know, at 8 a.m. Um, and that's where Aldi came unstuck. They said, no, these are just getting ready for work. Fair Work said, no this is them actually working. Um, and they are going through the process now of having to calculate back pay for a lot of employees. So we just need to be a little bit cautious about what we're asking employees to do before their start time. Um, the next case is a working from home rights case, um, which I think is a really good outcome. Um, because certainly through COVID, we saw a lot of people doing some work from home duties. We saw a lot of arguments um, starting to arise when businesses said, hey, time to come back in. And people saying, yes, but I should be allowed to continue to work from home. Um, I realise in this industry, there's not as much working from home that occurs, but still good to know if you do have anyone who is. Working from home is not a right Keep in mind, it does depend how you've engaged them. If you've engaged them on a contract that says you work from home, then that's part of their contract. But by and large, most businesses engage employees to work on site. And then at some point they might say, yep, it's okay for you to work a day from home or, you know, when you need to 
it's all right, we've got some flexibility, you can have a day working from home if that's possible for your job. What this case found was previously having worked at home or another role within the business working from home does not give an automatic right to another employee to also work from home. And I think that's a really good outcome. Um, general protections. Um, this one was really interesting and we've actually had a number of phone calls lately through the QFVG line around businesses changing hands, which this one relates to. Um, employee in a cafe environment worked for one employer, that employer sold to another. Um, the new employer uh, had this this worker, this casual worker, come in and do a shift. The casual worker at the end of that said, hey, um, what's my pay rate going to be? They went back and said, look, we're not going to pay you what you were on the 27.46. We, we're paying 23 per hour flat rate. It appears that the employee has kind of gone, oh, look, I don't think that's fair. And essentially the new employer said, no more shifts. Um, the employee has claimed general protections on the basis of I – um, was trying to claim my entitlements as an employee and you terminated me, um, which is grounds for general protections. Coffee smugglers, as the new employer, argued, no, we never actually employed him. So we gave him a trial shift. We don't think it worked out and therefore we haven't offered him the role. But based on their behaviours of giving him forms to fill out, um, never actually communicating it was a trial period, having said to all the employees, we're going to offer you employment in the, under the new entity, um, all of those things, Fair Work said, no, 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 you did employ him, um, which means he is entitled to general protections. Uh, and so that case now will still go through because the, the first disagreement was around, is he even allowed to lodge an application? So now we get to watch and wait and see whether or not um, whether or not what the outcome is of, of his claim. Um, key learning, trial shifts can count for the purpose of that general protection style claim. Oh, this one, for those of you who read the QFVG newsletter and got through this, congratulations. It is one of the most ridiculous um, <laughs> outcomes I have ever seen. Um, in a nutshell, We've got an employee, um, a finance manager, who has been asked a reasonable question around how to process a certain payment type, um, has come back with a bit of a um, belligerent answer. The next level up manager gets involved and says, hey, look, not appropriate. She starts using a whole lot of capitals uh, in her emails, attends a meeting where they talk about it, swears at them, storms out. Um, is absent from the workplace for a number of days despite a whole lot of urgent tasks needing to be done, does not respond to their attempts to contact um, to find out where she's at, is she intending to come back. Eventually, the executive director, her, her one-up manager, um, sends her communication to say, look, um, this has been inappropriate. We are going to, um, you know, consider termination of your employment. They've actually followed some really good processes. The employee's behaviour is absolutely inappropriate. And when you read the full decision, Fair Work has actually said they've described this employee in quite um, scathing terms. However, <laughs> they said your reason to terminate is valid, but your process was unfair. And it was unfair on the basis that um, that one-up manager, the executive director, who was a party to the conversation where she has stormed out, said F you, um, et cetera, that executive director was also the one who made the decision around the outcome. And they said, given that that person is a party to um, the complaint, in a sense, or the, the inappropriate behaviour, they are not objective in making the decision as to what the outcome should be. Um, which just feels like such a technicality, um, but it is a lesson for, for employers. If there is poor behaviour and it needs to be investigated, get that objective third party to do it. Remove whichever manager is involved, get a different manager um, stepping into that, an external party, whoever you need to, but just make sure that you bring 
um, a degree of independence and objectivity to that decision making if it's going to end up in termination. In this instance, and this is a not for profit organisation, they had to pay $12,000 additional to the employee um, for the honour of having just missed that one step. Crazy. All right, finally, our predictions. Um, in terms of what we think, what we predict in our crystal ball of what may come through in future, um, limits on the use of restraints of trade. So probably not something that gets used a lot uh, in entry level in this industry, but certainly may well be in higher level positions. Um, there's been uh, legislation that's come in uh, over in the US, which is uh, restricting restraints of trade. Um, it's certainly really hard already in Australia to uphold a restraint of trade on an employee. We think it's probably going to be something that um, Australian legislation starts to look at. Reproductive leave. So Queensland public servants are going to get 10 paid days to access reproductive health care. So things like IVF, um, fertility treatments, um, care for endometriosis, and even preventative screenings for breast cancer and prostate cancer. Um, now that's Queensland public servants. Uh, Tony Burke came out really recently and said, no, we have zero intention of having any kind of reproductive leave brought in across um, you know, our national employment system. We still think it might be something that comes out at some point. Um, you know, if you think about our trend of uh, paid parental leave increasing, family and domestic violence leave coming into play, becoming a protected attribute, you know, this has potential to be something that uh, ends up on the political scale later. Um, award changes to allow extension of annual leave by taking it at half pay. Now, this is something that I can't remember exactly which way around it was, but I think it's unions applied for to Fair Work and um, employer bodies are supporting. And essentially what it means is you don't get additional annual leave, but you could say, look, I've got my four weeks accrued. I would like to take it over eight weeks, but just get paid at half pay. Still by agreement, that's the part that, you know, these, this is what needs fine tuning is the legislation or the, the terms around which it can be done. But in essence, what the employer bodies are saying is we've got no issues with this. In fact, it can be a good way to get balance, but it still needs to be by agreement. It's not an entitlement to say I'm going to take eight weeks at half pay because, of course, for some employers, they will say, no, I actually need the person there. Whereas other employers will go, absolutely, that works. Um, you know, it is a good balance. Payday Super is coming. Um, it looks like 1st of July 2026 is the start date. And essentially what this is, is where at the moment um, employers pay the superannuation guarantee either monthly or quarterly. Uh, what will come into play, we believe, is that they will start to pay it on payday. So when you click your button to process your payroll, you're also clicking your button to process payment of their superannuation. Um, and the other decision that is already made, but we're just waiting to see how it gets rolled out, um, is the aged care work value. So um, not relevant to the hoard industry, um, but it's the kind of thing that we may see with the pay equity orders um, if they come into play in the coming year as well, where the government gives much larger increases in certain awards where they believe that there is um, gender inequality in pay. Now, the Hoard Award has not been listed as one of those, um, but they are looking closely at um, essentially any industry that um, is potentially on low paid wages for um, mainly females, that gender inequality factor. That covers it. <laughs> I am going to um, go through our... Um, our questions and um, come back on that because I am just conscious that I have gone over. Um, Nat, I think there was a little bit at the end that you wanted to cover as well. Uh, yeah, I know, I'll just get myself off. So um, I'll do this real quick. So just thank you everyone for hanging in there because that was a lot to take in. But um, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> just reiterating, we have recorded this. We will send it out to all of our members and anybody that has joined us today and uh, including their Naomi's team has put together that workbook as well with all the details in it. Um, so keep an eye on your uh, email inboxes. Um, 
also the Hort Award rates uh, when they're released, we'll also send out a separate email uh, informing everybody of what they ended up becoming. Um, so just wanted to do a little quick, um, we've spoken a lot about workplace relations, but another key element of why members say that they join us is our advocacy. So just wanting to give everyone a little quick update about the We Give a Fork advocacy campaign. And there is one key outcome that has come from this that we just want to let everybody know about, um, and that is the Geared Up Growers program. Um, so Geared Up Growers uh is rolling out sort of from actually this week, so from Thursday this week, and we'll be going through to the end of September this year. So it is uh, one part of it is the negotiation tactics masterclasses. Um, so these are for not only the grower owners or business managers, but they're for your staff as well. So anybody that works within your business that might have a role in sales uh, agronomy, they might be um, category managers, anything like that, please do consider uh, whether this per professional development is appropriate for them. So it's all about uh, understanding how retailers, agents and suppliers think and what shapes their behaviour, negotiating better deals and leveraging that grocery code and hawk code to create a uh, commercial advantage. So spaces are limited and um, you can find more uh, at the geardupgrowers.com.au. And lastly, just a reminder that we have got our member rewards program. Uh, so do check back regularly because I did upload a new one this morning. Um, so there are discounts and services and all gamut of things that members can take advantage of within this rewards program uh, sphere. And finally, um, if there are any non-members on uh, today, um, just a reminder that if you do want to find out more about becoming a member, you can give our head of memberships and partnerships, Tim Hayden, a call uh, or head on over to our website at qfeg.com.au to find out more. So that's it. Thank you, everyone.